Cool. So I, I want to step back a little bit um, and do a 10,000 foot overview of, of why we're doing this. Um, and actually, it's based on historical reasons. We had SMB1 Unix extensions, which allowed very good POSIX to POSIX semantics over SMB1. Um, and you know, this was actually supported by a lot of people. Samba was the only server that actually implemented these. And they, were, um, they worked, they were pretty well performant, and they had better POSIX semantics than NFS going between client and server. Uh, and so, you know, this is my favorite slide, um, mainly because you can actually say either of those, either Khan is NFS and SMB is, is Kirk or the other way around, um, either of them works. And of course, meanwhile in the cloud, um, they're busily working on replacing and, us all and, uh, and absorbing us into their, uh, into their culture to service them. Um, so the problem with um, the original extensions is that they were not a train wreck. Um, in terms of protocol design. They were developed organically. Uh, they were developed peop as people needed stuff. They just threw them in there. People came up with, hey, that wouldn't it be a cool idea if, is always the worst statement you ever want to hear when you're doing protocol design. Uh, and so st stuff got thrown in. Um, one of the biggest security disasters, and this was my fault, a design decision, was to allow clients to create server-side sim links. Um, that's a mistake I intend not to repeat with SMB3 POSIX. Um, but it had some very, very useful consequences. So for instance, the SMB1 POSIX extensions were the first protocol chains that allowed transport level uh, encryption. Um, um, that was actually later on adopted for SMB3. Uh, I think the fact that we had that um, working was a, a, a quite a spur to Microsoft engineers to actually work out a way of doing that in SMB3. Um, so monorail, monorail, who doesn't love a monorail? Um, SMB3 Unix, we have a clean slate. So the idea is to use the concept of complete minimalism. If the existing SMB3 protocol has a way of doing something, just use it. Do not invent something new. Um, that was the problem with the SMB1 extensions. Like SMB itself, which has kind of five different ways to open a file, the SMB1 uh, POSIX <coughs> extensions had like three different ways to get the timestamps on a file. This, don't do this stuff. So deciding that we were only going to do what SMB3 did and extend in only the small areas that we needed to cuts down the feature space immensely. It makes it a, a tractable problem um, that's a, a much cleaner design. And essentially, allow close enough. Say, hey, Windows does it this way. POSIX is slightly different. But you know what? This is good enough. And then reuse all the existing SMB3 features, like encryption, ACLs, um, the uh, Windows NFS kind of storage. So Apple <coughs> you adopted SMB3 for all their clients um, and has an Apple SMB server. And they extended SMB3 in their own way. And they did it kind of similar to the SMB1 extensions. So they have a magic create context that after you've mounted, uh, after you've mounted a share, you have to open the root directory with this magic create context. And that flips a bit on the server that says, oh, I'm doing magic now. I will do Apple things instead of standard Windows things. Uh, and that's the kind of horror that I was really, really trying to avoid when we were designing the SMB3 uh, Unix extensions. So you know, because we, we have the guy who used to work on NetATalk, he now works on Samba with us, um, basically, we used to claim that we had to be bug, bug for bug compatible with Windows. Now we have to be bug for bug compatible with two servers, the Apple server and the Windows server, depending on whether this magic mode bit, this magic create context has been sent. So um, <clears throat> how do we do the uh, initial um, flip into SMB3, POSIX extensions? Well, as Steve just showed you on the slides, we send the magic create context containing a GUID. Why do we do that in a create context? Originally, I was trying to avoid having to do, uh, why do we do that in a negotiate, which is the first protocol set up? I was originally trying to avoid that. The reason we do it that way is so that if a server doesn't respond, the client knows 
that it won't do POSIX extensions. However, if the server does respond and says, yes, I will do POSIX extensions, but when you ask for them on a specific share and the server refuses you, the client then knows, oh, it's not refusing me because it doesn't understand what I'm asking for. It's a specific policy that is saying, I'm not going to give you POSIX semantics on this share. And for a, reason, for a reason that might be useful, imagine that you're exporting stuff from a, a, a laptop, and one of the things you're exporting is a memory stick, which is formatted with FAT32. So you don't want to claim that you can support POSIX semantics when you're exporting that FAT32 share. So by policy, the server could say, hey, I'm going to give you Windows semantics on this share, POSIX semantics on the other. And the client knows the difference. The client isn't left in the dark as to whether it refused POSIX because it doesn't understand POSIX or it refused POSIX because there's a policy that's saying no. Um, let's see. Uh, yep, we already... Um, yes, so the, the main thing about the POSIX extensions uh, server side is that everything is handle-based. So what happens is you can open, obviously, many handles to a remote SMB server the, what, the handles that you want POSIX semantics on, you add the POSIX create context. So it's basically a GUID, 120-bit um, blob. You stick on there, and it says, hey, on this handle, I want it to behave like POSIX. And that causes the server to do things differently. We already have code inside Samba that does this differently for the SMB1 extensions. Having said that, we, we have 90% of the code there working. That we, the feature set is complete, theoretically, on the server side. And now Steve and I are actually discovering the bugs, which will take the rest of the 90% to, to nail down. Um, so let's see. Yeah, we've covered that. Case sensitivity has gone over. Um, oh, a, a few more things. No POSIX ACLs. Um, nobody uses them. They're not really useful. Windows ACLs only. No UIDs and GIDs. Everything is Windows SIDS. Active Directory has won the war. It owns the world. Let's just live with SIDS. Uh, if you want, if local Unix systems can have UIDs, GIDs, etc., but when you want a global namespace for your user IDs and GIDs, just use SIDS. And so that's what we do on the wire. There is no way and should be no way of asking the server, what is the UID for this file? It should only ever return a SID. Um, and the clients have got to cope with doing that anyway. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve's already showed that we can do the, the reserved name, uh, names with colons in, etc. things that Windows doesn't like. Uh, and, and basically, everything else comes for free. Uh, we get snapshots from SMB3 time warp tokens. We get uh, encryption clustering based on the, uh, uh, the Windows semantics. We get SMB Direct. We have leases. All, all of the really cool stuff. I think, yeah, there's a few ugly parts. I think we're probably, oh, and Simlinks are a disaster. So um, this is the reason I'm, I'm disallowing server-followed <coughs> symlinks uh, over SMB3. Um, long story, the guy who invented, the guy who discovered Meltdown and Spectre, Jan Horn at Google, uh, when he first started as a young engineer, he cut his teeth beating the crap out of Samba, which was kind of fun, because he didn't know I worked for Google and I was getting these bug reports into the samba.org email address. And he didn't even know I was a Google employee. So, so we, he cut us no slack, put it that way. Um, so he found race conditions in our symlink handling code, which took over three months to fix, um, essentially that allowed you to escape from the, root of a, from the root of a share by using the POSIX extensions, the SMB1 POSIX extensions, to create a server-followed symlink. So I decided that I was not going to let that happen with, um, with SMB3. So um, we're not... We're not storing them in standard um, file server, uh, file system symlinks. We're going to store them in EAs with a special tag. Uh, OK, I think we're kind of done. And Steve, do you want to flip back to? Sure, there are a couple of quick things. Um, I found it kind of funny that uh, Apple had a uh, call, as Jeremy was, what is the UID of the current user? It's Unix UID. And by the way, if, if you don't really support UIDs, it is possible to send a SID that includes the UID with a well-known prefix, but... Uh, yeah, there are, there are magic escapes into Unix UIDs and GIDs. If you really, really have to have UIDs and GIDs, there's a way of tunneling them inside SIDS. Uh, yeah. anyway. I mean, the fun thing is we've dealt with the POSIX metadata. 
We've dealt with POSIX locking. You can actually see that already. Um, we've dealt with um, basically the major requirements. There are some smaller ones that are necessary, the case sensitive uh, extended attributes you made an example of. Um, we talked about the server perspective of this. Um, remember on the negotiate protocol, we really have quite simple um, context. Uh, the tree connect in future contact, we may do something, but right now there's nothing needed. Um, we can return case sensitivity if we wanted to. There's already a QFS info call for that. Uh, basically, we know on an open whether or not the server supports POSIX with the new POSIX context. We're leveraging existing SMB311 features. Um, if you're curious about the POSIX owner and mid inf uh, and uh, information in the ACL, take a look at uh, the, uh, the owner SID, the group SID, the mode SID. These are already documented in WSPP. We're able to leverage this. Number of info levels is rather small. And one thing I wanted to note was Aurelian at SUSE did a nice job on extending the Wireshark de detector. There's also Pike sample test code if you enjoy looking at that kind of stuff. Um, there's the, the Git tree for this. And I also wanted to mention as much as we love Samba, as much as we love Azure and all these wonderful things, this isn't just about Microsoft. It's not just about Samba or anything else, right? I was f fascinated at Tel Aviv a few weeks ago um, at the test event, the SMB3 test event, one of the vendors closed source server had, uh, had implemented uh, uh, you know, prototype version of this as well, um, server side. And you know, obviously at the SNEA conference we saw some as well back in, uh, in Santa Clara uh, a few months earlier. So there are other servers looking at this. I'll be very excited to see other implementations. What I like about this is it's small and it addresses a real problem and it allows us to leverage this enormous toolbox we have years of work to do to implement all the SMB features that are coming out release after release. This is a lot of fun to do. Remember, we're talking not just about Macs and Samba and Windows and Azure. There are lots of servers with these really cool features. And it's an exciting thing. It's an exciting time. So, so SMB3 really is the universal solvent. A couple of years ago at the S, uh, SNEA Stories Developers Conference, we actually demonstrated uh, Mac, Windows, Linux, uh, I think it was Chrome OS and uh, Android, all accessing the same files on an Azure file server. Um, oh, and an embedded camera too. All accessing seamlessly over the internet. Um, all with the implementations? Yes, completely different implementations. Uh, and so that's, that's true interoperability. Um, so what are, you, what, what are the next steps? Um, Steve's code is going into the kernel uh, right now. The server code is slowly being pushed from the experimental tree into the mainline Samba tree. Um, this will happen somewhat slowly, mostly because the main thing that we need to finish is a boatload of interoperability tests. So we need to write uh, like 100 million more tests to freeze the semantics in, that, uh, in a way that people will actually, um, can actually implement and can understand and can check that their implementation actually matches what we've written down as a spec. So uh, exciting times, uh, lots more work to do. If anyone wants to help out, I'm always happy to, to have coders join us. And there's one other thing I wanted to, to beat a dead horse about, right? We, we love, one of the things I found fascinating, the, the Samba test code that he's talking about is actually bigger than most file servers. So that's wonderful. But that's a simulated client. So running with the real client, we've been relying a lot on XFS test. We skip something like 400 tests, OK? NFS skips many tests as well. Ceph skips many tests. We can cut this down, but every single one of those XFS tests, we have to look through those skips and see if it's something, is it relevant for a file system other than XFS or perhaps ButterFS. If it is relevant, does it belong in the extensions? It's a lot of work to go through case by case by case, all the XFS tests, but it's very exciting. So uh, I think um, given that, we wrap up, and if anyone has any questions about what we're up to, um, now would be a good time. There is a break coming up, so I'll forgive you if you... <laughs> Thanks very much.